Thanks, Pete. Ollie, thank you very much, and on you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those of you that don't know us already, I'm Ollie, and this is Pete. And as Kenny said, we run the uh, well, we, we run the Argyle uh, Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organisation. The centre we work from is actually called the, the Argyle Beaver Centre. So that kind of gives you um, a clue as to where our expertise lie. Um, we started up originally by uh, taking people for guided walks um, to, to see the, the Napdale beavers in the area. But we've branched out because we're, we're both ecologists, really. And we've branched out into showing people and talking about all the magnificent wildlife that we're lucky enough to have in our area. And, you know, right across the UK and Scotland. And most recently, uh, we were lucky enough to go on a birdsong identification course online with the BTO. And then the second, yeah. sorry, British Trust for Ornithology. I had to think about that. Right? <laughs> um, and then the second part of that course was um, a training day to train people that were, had been on the ID birdsong ID course into doing some um, monitoring, so gathering scientific data, um, which will all help towards uh, monitoring over the years how well our songbirds are doing, uh, whether they're in decline or improvement in any particular area. So they actually brought that course to us at the centre and we hosted them and participated. And we were so enthusiastic because of uh, our hosts, um, Steve and Ben, who ran the course online, and then Steve that came and did the, the actual physical training course, that uh, we wanted to share our enthusias uh, enthusiasm about learning about birdsong. Um, neither of us are experts at all uh, in, in bird watching, bird listening, whatever you want to call it. We're not these guys. We're not twitchers. Um, I, I wouldn't even call myself a birder. I'm, I'm a, an amateur observer and interested. So um, as I've already seen one or two people, we're carrying around uh, bird guides with us. Um, I've most recently uh, downloaded an app on my phone to tell me what the birds are and um yeah we're both we're often sitting outside the center observing um the birds on our feeders and overhead um so we wanted to know more and we've learned quite a bit from our, our little i think it was a, was it a three-week course three mm -hmm. evenings was yeah, it three, three evenings, evenings on a monday um so we've kind of condensed that the, the bto have very kindly given us their slides which is what you're seeing um, I think they sent over 103 slides, I think it was. We're not going to go through all of those with you this evening. Um, but I would encourage you, if you um, like what you're seeing on these slides uh, and the kind of the, the gentle mannerism, if you like, of this presentation, and you are interested in doing more, get in touch with the BTO uh, have keep an eye on their website they do have a courses page where they do lots of online or physical courses uh, and get booked on with their uh, with them they're absolutely fantastic and they are the experts and one of the concerns that they've had <clears throat> is that the, um, the number of people who are data recording despite our girl bird club being absolutely fantastic is that, that that's only just within our kind of west coast of Scotland they do need more people to help. Um, we'll, we'll do a bit more about this at the end, but the British Trust for Ornithology on a whole series of recording schemes from the very simplest, as in what's on your bird table um, and how many of them are there, to much more complex things like wetland bird surveys, breeding bird surveys, and then very specific surveys I did one of those a couple of years ago. I stood in pitch dark, got completely disorientated and listened to tawny owls because they were doing a tawny owl calling survey. Um, and a lot of these surveys are ongoing. BTO have been running some of these um, surveying techniques now for nearly 40, 50 years. And the value of data is its length over time and then the trends that you can develop from it. And, that, and that's, that's ultimately the fascination. 
one of the only ways we can protect our wildlife is first of all by knowing more about it and secondly knowing how it's doing and I suppose with things like birds we're still learning an awful lot. Um, one of the I suppose surprising things that, that folk find is how long that birds will live um, and it's only through the initiation of ringing schemes back in the 1960s and 1970s that we're now getting some inclination of how long birds can live. Um, the oldest breeding kitty wake um, successfully hatched eggs last year. She was 74. Um, she's had two, because kitty, uh, not kitty wakes, um, albatross, sorry, uh, was 74. <laughs> albatross mate for life. Um, she, she went all the way through. One husband who died in his mere 50s, I think it was, um, and then she picked up with another male, and she's now a toy with, boy. A toy boy, <laughs> yes. Yeah, much younger than her. Well, inevitably much younger than her. <laughs> um, we wouldn't have had the slightest idea about that without ringing scheme. Mm. Our oldest oyster catcher apparently is 37. Um, puffins live to a phenomenal age. That's interesting in itself, but what's fascinating <laughs> about that is the way that we then react to the conservation of those species. If things don't live very long, you realize there's a problem very quickly. When things live for a very long time, they mask that problem for a very long time. And then you suddenly get a catastrophic collapse as, as numbers fall, for whatever reason. Um, we all know the reasons for the decline in birds. It's the same as the reasons for the decline in all other species. We've got habitat destruction, we have climate change, we have pollution, we have pesticides and herbicides. Um, we have the, the breakup of habitats as well. Um, all of these are very complex and interrelated problems. And the other additional problem that birds have, of course, is that they fly and they don't all sit in the same country all the time. So any conservation efforts have got to be international. There's no point in having a national conservation effort for something that spends half the rest of its life in Africa. Um, you need to not only protect that animal where it lives, breeds, and where it migrates to, but also the passage along that line. So there are an awful lot of reasons why. Um, that's that's the, the conservation bit. Yeah, and I know this isn't actually about conservation. Um, it's more really about the experience we had and to try and give you a few, a few simple tips, because we're only on the simple tips in terms of the different ways you can identify birds. That's where it all starts from, is just an interest in what we've got around us. Um, and there's nothing nicer, in my opinion, than, than sitting in, for a quiet moment with a cup of tea, watching your bird feeder out the window and seeing what appears. And when you can identify them, uh, then we get the pleasure of, of knowing the variety as well. Um, and that can be that can be quite fascinating. And even just recording and sharing that information is helping towards the conservation efforts as mm -hmm. well. So to start with that, um, usually we'll go out and buy a bird book, which is uh, there's the, the 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 one that the BTO recommended to us, and I've downloaded a, an app which gives me that whole bird book on my phone. Is the Collins version, um, and it is brilliant. The one we use at the centre generally is the RSPB one of Scottish birds. Uh, really enjoy that one too. But it also know, narrows down the options. It does, yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is helps us. Good. Um, but. Um, because, yeah, this one is Great Britain and Europe, so uh, it's for more dedicated and travelling um, bird enthusiasts, I think. Um, but the RSPB one, narrowing it down to the Scottish one, is, is fantastic as well. But the app is brilliant as well. So if any of you are into technology and want to download the app, the app gives you the addition of listening to the bird call. Because, of course, most bird textbooks that we can buy are, are concentrating on the visuals. Now, that's only one method of identifying the bird. Uh, and even that can be quite difficult because there's obviously plumage uh, and coloration, but there's, a, there's also form and behaviour. How is it moving? What's it doing? Does it have um, uh, a typical 
uh, flight pattern that can be identified. So there's lots of different elements in looking at identifying a bird. In fact, I think <laughs> I think it's um, it's actually mentioned on here. Um, it's not that hard. It can be daunting looking up birds. Um, my, my parents are visiting me at the moment and they're sitting looking out the window at, at our bird feeder and my dad will say, well, they're all just little brown things. Um, but when you really start looking and you have a good guide with you, it, it, it isn't that hard if you if you know how to sort of divide things up into, well, what shape beak has it got? Um, what size is it? How is it moving? Where is it? So... Obviously, the plumage is, is the first thing we look at with colour, size and shape, as I've mentioned, behaviour. Is it hopping around on the ground? Is it is it swooping through the air? What season are we in? Um, we've got lots of migrants, things like swallows. If you're looking at something swooping through the air and it's November, it's unlikely to be a swallow or a swift. So you can narrow things down to certain sections of your bird guide or looking things up on the internet. And where are you? If you're out on an open moor, um, you're, you're unlikely to see a woodland bird. So again, you can get different guidebooks or different um, looking things up on the internet or apps that can narrow that down for you. So it's, it's never been more easy to try and identify birds. And what we're going to concentrate on most uh, this evening is the, the, the noises that come from birds. So they do tend to have two things that they do, songs and calls. Um, when um, Steve Willis came up to this BTO course and walked up the track um, prior to anybody arriving to suss the place out, basically, he came back to us and said, you've got too many birds. <laughs> he said, there are far too many birds here for training course. Um, he was half joking, but he did have a point. In the, in the middle of the, the maximum period of um, bird song, if you're a rank amateur, um, with lots and lots of birds trying to outcompete each other, some having bits of their song that are very similar. It can be quite confusing, which is why it was so useful to have somebody with that expertise to tease out the different species. Um, if you're on top of a... Can you just go back a second? Sorry. If you're on, if you're on top of a moor, um, th that process of elimination becomes very relevant. There are far fewer birds. They tend to be more specialised. Um, so each... If you take each one of those as a step, I suppose, you... You whittle it down to fewer and fewer birds. The only one that where your bird guide might need to be bang up to date <coughs> is when you're looking at something like season and status, because that is now all over the place. Um, so maybe not in Argyle, but seeing a swallow in November further south may not be that unusual. Um, they're starting to overwinter on the south coast of England. Birds, like any animals, make their decision based on energy more than anything else. If it takes more energy to get to Africa, um, and there's a chance that there'll be sufficient insect life on the south coast of England, why bother making that massively hazardous journey? The other advantage you have, if you manage to hang on here, is that in the spring, in the early spring, you're on the spot you make the assessment as to whether the weather is suitable for breeding or not, and you will end up on your nest site a lot quicker than something that's coming back from Senegal or South Africa or wherever, plus all eliminating many of the hazards of the way. So we're seeing lots and lots of disruptions is one way of putting it, or changes is another as the climate warms and even more importantly, the weather patterns change. So quite a lot of migration routes now are much more difficult than they would have been 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, we've seen much more violent weather. Um, we saw some violent weather a couple of days ago. Taking a beaver walk around Lock Farm, Michigan, the other night, a hazel tree had literally been washed down the hill by the force of the water. Not the beaver's fault. That was <laughs> not their fault. So, uh, um, and I've noticed this now with the RSP we Scotland, but it updates itself quite quickly with the conservation status of the animal. Um, and, and of course, the other thing is, is we are seeing a massive 
um, diminishing of our bird life for all sorts of reasons. So once common species are, are falling on the red lists, somebody came up with a very pertinent comment the other day, we've never seen so many gulls when there are so few, which is very, very correct. We've got red listed gull species now, and yet most people just see them as a pest and there's loads of them everywhere. That's not the case. And we just see more of those that are left, not there are more of them. So that's just one thing to, to bear in mind with that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll run through a, a few of the things uh, that we look at, uh, apart from plumage. Uh, there's going to be a test on that for you all at the end. Uh, just to, you know, we'll, we'll pick the most obvious thing that people look at in a, in a guidebook um, and give you a quick test because just to make sure you're still awake at the end of the talk, basically. Um, but we'll start by looking at um, sizes and shape. So um, I'd, let's have a bit of audience participation here. Can anybody, would you like to just unmute and shout out, uh, can any anybody tell me what they think the smallest bird is here? Robin? Yep, yeah, fantastic. What about the next one along? Blackbird? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And um, we've got a room full of experts here. Um, number three? Pigeon. Wood pigeon? Perfect. Yeah, pigeon of some sort. Number four, getting a little bit more tricky. Raven. Rook? Mm. Yeah, could be a corvid of some sort, rook or raven. Um, I would probably, or crow, you would probably guess crow. I'm not sure, maybe. maybe. Um, and the hardest one of all at the end. Ostrich. Yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> which, <laughs> which breed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, or common and gardener, chicken. Um, so looking at the overall form of the birds, uh, you know, we've just proven there, uh, helps us to ID the bird without even looking at the colour. Uh, so that's the first kind of things that you can you can concentrate on when you're looking at a bird that you're not quite sure what it is. Um, I, can we say something else? About of course. That? If you take the um, the COVID, what tells you it's COVID? What sticks out? What are the what are the features that differ to other birds, for example? What would you pick out Very first? Of all? The beak. Yes. Yeah. The beak is the Absolutely. one that strikes I, I, The first thing I looked at was the beak, and then I looked at the legs to see whether it was wearing shaggy trousers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, rooks have shaggy, shaggy yeah. trousers. So, again, yeah. um, if you look at something like that generic pigeon, we all know what a pigeon looks like, but fat and round. how are we identifying it? Fat and round, yeah, I suppose. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's kind of training our brains, especially if we're seeing, because as Pete said, birds don't stay in one place, they flip around. Um, if you can train your brain to grasp immediate things that come to your attention, which are, you know, oh, it was a, it was a flash of red, or so colour obviously is, a, is a, um, an automatic one, but then pick out characteristics what are its features what's its size what's its beak size relative relative to its head is it upright is it low to the ground or it are its wings low like a blackbird's is it tail is its tail sticking in the air like a, like a hen um, the, um, the phrase that you see in a lot of the bird books certainly in the rspb mm. one is they will tell you about that bird relative to a familiar bird so it's the same size as a sparrow, a yes. starling, a swallow, a pigeon, or whatever. That's their that is their first hint to you as to where you are in terms of it. So if what you think is a, a collared dove and it's actually the size of a heron, you're probably on the wrong the wrong track. You know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> I wouldn't like to meet that. No, no, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, looking at these things. I mean, I know they're waders. I, as I said at the beginning, I'm no expert. I don't know what these birds are, but I can immediately assess, well, they're brown. They've got very long legs and very long beaks. Oh, right, that one's got a black beak. That one's got a pink beak with a bit of muddy end, I think, there. And you can start to train your brain to pick out these little features. So I know that I would turn to the, the wading bird section in my bird book. Oh, that's a lovely cat's tail there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Um, and then I would start to pick out the 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 other visual clues, like what are the colour of its legs? What's the colour of its beak? Does what colour is round its eye? Does yeah, it have you a, see the one a pattern. The smaller one has a black eye stripe. Yeah, the one at the top has a very pale eye stripe. Yeah. The one that's got, <laughs> say, the feet are mm -hmm. from here anyway look to be webbed. So all of those, there are an awful lot of um, clues. Clues, and there are an awful lot of wages that look fairly similar. Around as there are lots of very small brown birds that look very Absolutely. similar. Absolutely. You need to stop trying to sort out which is which. The silhouette exercises that we did on this BTO course I found really useful because lots of the time, if it's not a wading bird on the shore, it's a bird flying through the sky. And especially with things like raptors, birds of prey, if you're looking up at them on a sunny day, you often can't, you're not going to get as good a picture as this that, um, or, or a visual as this. They're often silhouetted against the sun. So being able to pick out, oh, are the wings absolutely straight from the body or are they slightly curved? Have they got long fingers at the ends of their wings? Are the wings broad? How many are there? How, how many, many wings? No, how many primary oh. feathers are there? <laughs> Okay. Um, does it have a? I mean, what what's the notable difference between these two bird shapes? If anybody would like to contribute, the tail, the fork in the tail, which That's is, I think, red kite, and then yeah. the other one is a golden eagle or a buzzard. Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the the kite here has got the very distinctive V fork tail. Um, this eagle has got um, a, a buzzard. I'm not, quite sure, has got um, a fanned tail, so very different things, but they're both raptors, both birds of prey. Um, this has got quite, um, a, I mean, I, I refer to that as an elbow. It's probably not, but it's a an angular wing. It's got a joint in its wing, uh, you know, a pointy end, whereas this one's got fingers that are, are splayed. So, again, that's going to really help me when I look at my bird group to identify these things. Whilst we were on that bird course and we're sitting outside the building mm -hmm. having our lunch, we were treated to two ospreys. Coming yeah. out. And again, when they fly towards you, you can see a, a definite curve mm -hmm. in the wing. I often have there. to go, is it a gull? Oh, no, it's an osprey. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah they look, look, look yeah, yeah. Um, superficially similar to a gull. Yeah. Um, oh, here we've got some more corvids. So, again, we've got three corvids. We can probably tell they're corvids because of, um, as was mentioned, earlier, big size relative to their head, big kind of hefty birds. But what are the three things, apart from size difference, that you might notice the difference of on these three silhouettes? Anybody wants to unmute to contribute? It's fine. The tails. Yeah, that's right. So. Oh, Again, we've got, um, I think this is known as a wedge-shaped tail, this kind of blunt-ended uh, wedge. This one is um, a little bit more fanned, uh, probably a little more defined fingers than, than the, the latter one here, or the left-hand one, which is a much more diamond-shaped tail. Um, so the next thing is... Once we've got the silhouette, we've identified it's a COVID. We might look at our bird books uh, or get your app out on your phone or whatever you might do and look at the different uh, shapes of the tail. But if you're lucky enough, we can hear sounds as well. So if they're shouting as they go past, um, shall we have a go and see if this mm -hmm. works? Sure. Uh, so the left-hand one, this says... Disappears. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so it's a very distinctive single call, single shout at each time. Does anybody want to have a guess at what that might be? Raven? Yeah, very distinctive, what we would describe as a cronk. Um, so cronk, cronk, cronk as it flies away. We've got a pair of ravens that um, nest on the ridge above our centre and they always say hello to us in the morning. Um, that's very it's they might not be nice. saying hello. <laughs> well, they might not be. Got the eyeballs. <laughs> it's a lovely sound. I love that. So this middle one says get it to work.
And then I'll just, yeah, we'll play the, the last one and see if we can hear a, dis a, a distinct difference. I'm going to play the middle one again because they're very similar calls. I mean, obviously, the last one is louder because I think it's closer. Oops, nope, don't need that. I need to play that one again. It's clear of sound. Yeah, and each each note is slightly more drawn out, in my opinion, than that harsher. So anybody want to have a guess between those two? The, the middle one first. Rook. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. The giveaway for me is the tail shape. Um, and the latter one on the right hand side. Anybody want to say what that might be? Crow of some kind. Hoodie or a yeah. cannon. Yes, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, I think they're they're very they're the same species, hoodies and carrions, aren't they? They're just more, different colorations. More carrion crows are moving into the west of Scotland. I saw one just I saw one with yeah. one of the hoodies yes. the just down the way yes. going into work the other day. Yeah. So Okay, so fantastic. So we've got yeah, we've looked at um our visual clues, our colours, our, our shapes, our silhouettes, we can add sound to that which will delve more into um, but the other thing that we mentioned was the behavior so how is it moving how is it behaving and um, if it's big and it's soaring round above you it's more likely to be a corvid or a um, or a bird of prey of some sort uh, but what about any other distinctive movements how it might fly um, different birds often have different flight patterns um, where is it sitting is it on the ground is it in a bush? Um, oops, and what's it feeding on? Um, does anybody know what this top bird is and what you might see it doing as a distinctive movement? It's a wagtail. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and what will it tail. be doing? Well, wag. Yay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, dipping up and down, isn't it? What, would anybody like to describe its flight? Undulating. Yeah. yeah. It, it, Almost appears to be quite weak. Yeah, quite close to the ground. Um, yeah, but it's never still. Yeah, it's always dotting about, busily looking for insects. Yeah. Would you see it perched up in a tree? Well, I'd see a boulder wandering around on your lawn. Or You see it by a river, maybe? Yeah, by a river. Yeah, you quite often find them by water. Um, I was looking at footage from one of our cameras the other day, and um, both wagtails that cropped up entered on the ground. They didn't fly into the, the scene, as it were. <laughs> they wandered in. Um, they zigzag about on the ground. As you say, the tail never stops flicking there. Insect eaters. Um, how do I know it's an insect eater, other than seeing it eating insects? But how would I make a guess that it's an insect eater? Beak no, shape. Pointed bill. Yeah, pointed yeah. bill. Sharp, yeah. pointed bill. It was taking insects off the um, coppice stump of a birch tree that was leaking sap. So the beavers had felled the birch tree. We quite often see insectivorous birds attracted to the flies that are attracted to the sap. Um, the other one that we quite often see doing that are wrens. Wrens will also come in for that. Um, birds are not slow. <laughs> they learn very quickly that those, those oozings from the trees that have been felled attract all sorts of insects, and especially in something like March or April, that's a real resource for something. Um, they're hungry at the end of winter, particularly insect eaters. So, so yeah, that also helps us to um, identify what section of the bird group we should be looking in um, and narrow the field down. So it's, it's all about elimination, basically. Um, another one, anybody want to tell me 
what this bird might be and what it might be doing. I love this one. My favourite song. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Where is this bird? It's in the... Is it a skylark? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so this is a skylark, which um, mm. has a very distinctive kind of display flight pattern. Yes. So I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen them and heard them. You probably hear them before you can see them quite often. Um, it's hovering around, tumbling around, and then they'll, they'll, they'll crumple down to the ground and then sort of ascend again, gradually singing and singing. So not only am I listening for a for a skylark, but if I can see them, I'm, I'm observing their, their movement, their behaviour, as well as the... Because, the, I mean, to be honest, it's just a little brown bird. It's not that distinctive. Well, um, it is, but it's several hundred metres up to the but sky. It's, but it's behaviour, <laughs> I mean, visually. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, going off plumage or something, it's not often what I'm seeing, uh, but what I'm looking at is its flight pattern, its behaviour. The other one for that, as we, again, we found out on the course, mm -hmm. was that habitat is really important here in, in making those distinctions. So... As we travel into work across the moss, you just move from one skylark territory to another. It's flat, open, moorland, um, all the cotton grass is out now, and, and the skylarks are displaying. And if you sit there long enough, even if you can't see them, eventually you can come, come down and then they'll loop up and back again. On the course, when we were going on, on the forestry track, we saw a bird doing more or less exactly the same thing. I saw that today yeah. at lunchtime. I was yeah. sitting outside with a cuppa, and I thought, what's a skylark doing here? And then I remember the course. Yeah. Oh, no, of course, it's not a skylark. Yeah. But it was doing that same tumbling so behaviour. We were looking at the wood pipit that does much the same thing. Tree um, pipit. Tree pipit, sorry, yeah, the wood pipit. Um, and that was the first one I'd seen up there, um, Same here. Was, They've probably been around and we've not known what we're yeah, looking at. Yeah. So but related species learning. and has similar bits of behaviour, but has a very different habitat. habitat yeah. It's a completely different place. <laughs> um, it's the other one. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, where you are in Scotland or wherever you're living, uh, might, off, might also give you clues. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the Collins Bird Guide there that we pictured is birds of um, UK and Europe. The RSPB one that we use uh, at the centre is Scotland specific. That really helps us. Um, I'm sure we all know this is a woodpecker here, but quite often if you open a, a bird guide to the woodpecker page, you're going to see greater woodpecker, lesser spotted woodpecker and green woodpecker. Now, we don't get green woodpecker up here. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> that might happen with the spotted so, so yeah. again, knowing where we are, what's uh, where in, the, in the country, in the UK, helps us narrow things down. And then also seasons. So this, this um, you know, wet location and then... Um, and then uh, time of year as well. So, um, again, summer migrants, winter migrants, or waders, that sort of thing, that we know that some species come and go. So narrowing things down in our bird book is not only just looking at the pictures, um, but having re a read of the text and, and finding out when the birds occur, when you're likely to see them too. And others, if we're talking about something like the woodpeckers that come to the centre, we, we can we can watch them through the season. We have a pair there. They all seem to have, I don't even know, it, it may not be the same pair, but whatever the pairs are, they all seem to have two fledglings. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very distinctive. Um, and when you start to look, superficially, they look exactly the same as the adults until you realise that the, the youngsters have a red, a red cap. Yes. The female doesn't have a cap at all. The male, um, as in the adult female, and the adult male has a little red, red bar right at the, the back, back of its head. head. And those are very distinctive. But then when you look at them a bit more closely, you realise that the fledglings just look kind of grubby. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're, and that's, that's not accident, that's design. So the parents from their breeding plumage 
um, are, are there to make a mark. They're, ma- they're there to show their status. They're there to show that they're, you know, the right animal to breed with. The fledgling doesn't want to advertise itself at all. So even though it's that distinctive black and white, but it's got a red hat on, it looks like it's been given a light dusting of soot when you're looking at it carefully. Its whites are toned down and its blacks are closer to grey. So in a woodland setting, when you've got something that's black and white stripes, and um, think of zebras in the Serengeti, um, that breaks up the pattern perfectly. So there are always there's always a reason as well for the for the colours. Um, the, the, the blue tits that will be out within the next week or two are exactly the same as the adults, but they've been done in pastel. Every single one of those vibrant blues and greens and yellows, they're all there, but they're all toned down. So, uh, and you get used to that kind of juvenile look of birds after all. So, as I was saying there, you know, that where they breed, when they breed, whether they're resident or migrant, that, that can be a bit tricky sometimes because that lovely robin that you see all year perched on your fork may well be a completely different robin in the winter. The one that you see all summer may have pushed off down to southern England. The one that, you, that you're looking at in the winter might have come across the summer in Europe. So even quite what we see as resident common birds will shift. Um, Chaffinches quite often take a summer holiday and they move out somewhere else and then they move back into a woodland area. And so they don't move very far, but they will do it sometimes. Um, siskins, we'll come back to siskins in a minute, but um, we had one that died uh, at the centre last year. It had a ring, so we sent the ring off and the BTO are great. You can, if you've got a magnifying glass and you can get the number and the recording. Um, uh, organization, which in this country is usually, you, you usually see as Natural History Museum. Um, and then there's usually a seven digit, not seven digit, seven figure code, usually three letters, four numbers. I got a return on that within 24 hours. Um, and it told me that the Siskin had been ringed when it was two years old. It had been ringed 220 kilometers to the northeast. Um, of where we found it, and that when it died, it was seven years old. Uh, last week, I was given another unfortunate siskin, um, which we think had disease. Um, and again, I got a return within 24 hours to tell me it had been um, ringed by somebody we know in Kilmartin three weeks ago, <laughs> and it was two years old. Two so, miles down the road. So, yeah. yeah, but the, the, you know, the, the siskin that died, which was from an accident, not disease or old age, was, was seven years old. That's quite a long time. That's a, quite a good age. And for most it, most people probably wouldn't have thought that it had come, you know, it had wandered down from the northeast of Scotland and ended up in a woodland in that pair. So. Okay, so we mentioned habitat as well. Uh, so we thought uh, we could give you a little test here and see what would be more likely that would hear uh, up, up on the tops here on open moorland and down by the river here. So let's try this one and see if we can identify. That's very, very faint. <laughs> I have no idea what that might be. Please shout out if you think you know what it is. I'm going to hear it better than we can. Anybody have any idea on that one? The swallow? Chittery chattery, wasn't it? It was chittery chattery, but that's kind of the wrong place. Um, Let's try the other one, see how we do. (laughs) If it comes out any louder. Anyone, anyone, any, any, anyone, any ideas? 
against Bill Ward, the third one as well. Then. hiding in the midst. Oh, I just got that one. The water's quite a big clue on this one. That animal, that bird, has a very distinctive movement as well. It's the zipper. Yes. yes. Well done. Well done. Um, <laughs> so, what, what, what would you expect to see if you saw, apart from the obvious, by the name, <laughs> a dipper? What would you expect to see it doing? Going underwater. Yes. Yep. It more or less walks underwater when it's looking for prey. Um, what about this when it's about rocks? Yes. Yeah. Yep. It like rocks. It nests in nests in the side of riverbanks. Um, again, another one of those animals that always seems to be constantly on the move as well. Yes. Um, funnily enough, you can. There's a dipper that lives on the weed, but a river that runs into the the bay in Loch Bilpin. Yes. Um, so is, yeah. sometimes they. It's it's the again. It's not necessarily it has to be. In remote moorland, if the if the river is the right type of river for it, you know they tend to find find them on fairly shallow, fast moving streams. Then they'll they'll make a living there. So, okay. It's also on the upper reaches of the canal, on the top reach. Oh, the Crillon Canal. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I've Fantastic. not seen one there. Uh, I've seen the kingfisher at that end yeah. as well. Um, Lucky you. <laughs> the, king, the, the kingfisher seems to spend most of its time posing for photographs on the jetty outside the Esso station as you go out a lot of Gilford. <laughs> so I've seen more photos from Argyle Bird Club of that kingfisher there than anywhere else. It must be a prime fishing spot. Um, so. so personally for me, I, I don't know what these two are, but by looking at the habitat, I would be looking at the open... Um, uplands section of my my birding app to help me look those up. Um, do you have a clue? No, I don't actually. No, I forgot what these two are. So, so you know, we said yeah. we're not experts, yeah. so, so it's just different clues that we're highlighting here of looking things up. We can hear it, we can't see it. Um, I could go to my app. I could look at the upland section of my app. And then I could start trying to narrow things down, looking for, for more clues like that. I should I should remember that. I should know that middle one. I know I've heard that one before. It, 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 it says at the bottom, experience helps. So mm -hmm. it's just a case of practicing the skills. Um, everybody know what this lovely little chap is here? Thank you. Okay. That's right. This is a male chaffinch. So absolutely gorgeous. They're looking really in their prime colours at the moment. Not for long. Not for long. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be looking like the haggard husband <laughs> in a few weeks' time, I'm sure. Um, Anne is that? saying there that she's seen a dipper in the mill laid at North Lanark. Oh, lovely. Lots of ducklings. Oh, very sweet. Yeah. Um, so dippers are quite something. Aren't they are, they're yeah. gorgeous yeah. characters. Whoops, oh. didn't realise I was um, going through there. Uh, so this is, um, when we're looking, at, when we're talking about audio for birds and we're listening to birds, birds tend to do two different things. Birds have a call and they have a song. So again, something that I hadn't um, thought about really uh, until I went on this course. Uh, so they're not just shouting the same thing all the time. They've got two different reasons to be to be verbal, I suppose. So this is one of those for a chaffinch. You could be excused for thinking that that's not very remarkable, rememberable, yeah. or just the sort of sound that birds make. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily meant to be. Um, bird's song is 
exactly as the word often, states. Yeah, is a song and it is often there to mark a territory, to give any visiting female some indication as to its breeding status or suitability, and also to warn other species, uh, birds of the same species, away from that territory. Um, birds, though, ecologically, um, may not work cooperatively, but simple calls can cut across the species. So a warning call within a woodland done by a blackbird. You've all heard that cackle that a blackbird will make as it shoots into a, um, a hedge or something. Or the, the, the sort of staccato sound of that cuts across species. So the birds are not quite making a collective decision, but they're warning all birds in the vicinity that there's danger or there's a predator around. So rather than just being this, you know, I'm all right, I've died for cover, I'm not going to say anything, the other guy's going to get it. They do do a certain amount of cooperative calling. And, and as it says there, in the winter, quite often small birds of different species will collect together and form a kind of generic flock. Um, things like blue tits, gold crests, um, long-tailed tits, small birds in general, um, again, particularly woodland, collectively, the decision has been made that they will use less energy by sharing resources than by going it alone and trying to find their own. And in a cold winter, that becomes even more apparent when you will find small birds huddling together. Um, the one that I love um, are the long-tailed tits that, again, are one of these animals that are always on the move and they constantly call to each other. That, that little kind of seep, seep, seep sound goes on and on and you hear it from a distance and you'll see them move through if you're lucky and then they're gone, long before you ever managed to get camera lens on. Um, and that constant calling and they're often related. Um, as a wider family will tell you that or they tell each other where each we're here, member is. We're here, we're here, yeah, we're here, we're here, we're here. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, they will make a different sound if they if they're alarmed or danger threatened. But lots of not just birds, lots of animals have a contact call, and it's usually pretty unremarkable. Um, but it just keeps the family in touch. Yeah. So, yeah, two types of calls, and then we've got song. Now, wonder why birds sing. So this is a, a lovely one. You might recognise this. So... Wood pigeon intrusion <laughs> in the background there. Um, but it, does anybody know what that one is? Song thrush. Yes, that's a song thrush. Mm -hmm. Song. Song. Uh, song thrush. We had this discussion the other we day. Sorry. This discussion. And missile mistake, thrush is sound miserable. much more miserable. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I loved um, the the BTO version of um, Aid Memoirs for these song calls. So the missile thrush. Uh, I was copiously taking notes through this um, course and the, the, the song thrush was um, uh, was busybody um, sort of gaggles of women talking to each other over the garden fence so it's um, diddy, 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 oh really, oh really, oh, oh you never knew, oh who knew that? So it, it's generally three times repeated Two or three times. Phrases that are, are sort of what you would imagine these sort of um, old wives with their headscarves and their handbags chattering to each other over the garden fence. That's my visualization for that one. And they also sound a bit like 
they've got all the notes that a blackbird has, yes. but can't quite string them together. Yes. And they put them together in an ever rotating succession of two or three note phrases. And just to make it interesting, song thrushes are quite good mimics as well. Oh, yes. So depending on where they live, they might just chuck in a bit of bird song from something else. and that that's Or a car alarm or a telephone. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> starlings are the classic for that. There was a starling at Kilmartin Museum when my wife worked there. And more and more than one occasion, she came out and said, there's a curlew in... <laughs> in somewhere in the grounds of the garden. I think that's impossible. And we eventually tracked it down to a starling that lived in a hole in the cafe wall, and it did a perfect mimic of a curling. <laughs> and through history, as always said, uh, in the 70s, they used to mimic trim phones, which used to confuse these people quite a lot as well, because they were hurtling around pretending to be a phone. I wonder um, if, they, if they moved into Nokia a few years ago. Anyway. There's too many ringtones now for them yeah. to establish. But... <laughs> So that repetitive, repeated series of quite, quite nice phrases, quite melodic yeah, very, sometimes. Very fruity, beautiful yeah. sounds. Um, is distinctive Rich. of a, a thrush. And just to make it a little bit easier, thrushes usually find a place to sing from. They want to shout it from the rooftops. So here, I was listening to one the other day, it's on the top of the church. So you're not going to get much taller in Ford <laughs> than the top of the church. That's where it sings from. Um, it sometimes has to argue with the rooks over that because they yeah. like sitting on there, as do the collared doves. Yes. Um, so, and it's defending a territory yeah. and attracting a mate. Absolutely. So again, two reasons for calls and two main reasons for, for singing now. So, oh yeah, shouty repeated phrases. Um, they've got down for the song thrush. Uh, I've got the, the busy body. Um, oh, never, never knew that. Oh, in my head. Um, oh, dear. oh, we've got a bit of a, an intruder <laughs> uh, into the song thrush audio that we're now going to listen to with these two. So back to the silhouette thing. These two pigeons look very similar in sort of shape. One's maybe a little less dumpy than the other, or slender, should I say, not being too polite. And very similar calls. So we'll have a listen. <laughs> And out at infinitum. Yes. <laughs> and this one falls a bit short. <laughs> on. So that one annoys me because it doesn't fit it. <laughs> That's because you're from England. I am. This one's got the hoo hoo on the end of its call, and uh, it was it was Ben that came, it was it Ben that came up with the um, the wonderful Abe memoir for this one. Um, so yeah, the this one is is faster, and this one is slower. We've got the length of the phrases, so this one does an extra hoo hoo at the end of its phrase. Lower, and higher, also lower, pitch. lower pitch than the other one. Um, this one is more fruity and scratchy, if you like. Um, constant repetition of the same phrase. That's a, a constant thing, um, a good thing to pick out when you're listening to bird song and trying to identify or learning to identify birds. It, are the phrases repeated or do, are there no phrases? Does it just rattle on? Um, the volume, obviously, as well. And this is the the aid memoir for the uh, big fat wood pigeon. Here is I love you, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. I can't get that out of my head now. It's <laughs> really creepy. Yes. Whereas um, the, the the lovely little collared dove dove here uh, doesn't have a daddy. It's just I love you. I love you. I love you. Which is quite appropriate, really, because um, collared doves always seem to be together. Yeah. Yeah. Very affectionate towards you, though, each other. <laughs> I was a bit worried about our pair because I kept only seeing one, but then, of course, the female might be sitting on eggs, so Very it might be okay. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know, three and a five? Is that volume level, probably? Yes. 
Oh, yes, three notes, five notes, of course. Um, so carrying on with these eight memoirs for the different bird calls, this is uh, what we're, a bird song, sorry. This is what we uh, really enjoyed about the course was Ben and Steve's ability to give us um, things to remember that trigger when we hear different bird calls. So back to our lovely uh, male chaffinch here that did that pink, pink, pink alarm call. The song is very different. The chaffinch uh, with his cigar here is the gangster of the of the small woodland birds. Um, and and the, the aid memoir is, ha, 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 I shot you. Um, so if you listen to uh, ha, 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 I shot you, you should be able to pick out that phrase in the call. Uh, descending, ha, 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 I shot you. I shot you at the end. <laughs> I can't help but hear that now everywhere. And there are chaffages everywhere. So there are. You. I shot you. <laughs> Again, it varies sometimes because chaffages, like lots of other birds, can have local accents. Yes. So uh, an English chaffinch might sound slightly different to a Scottish chaffinch. Or there might be a West Coast chaffinch as opposed to an East Coast chaffinch. But do you reckon general, some are harder than the others? Well, quite possibly. Yeah. The, 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 Bigger cigars. The general pattern, though, remains, and the either the ascendancy or descendancy of the song as well will remain. Sometimes they might chat an extra note, um, sometimes they might repeat it a little bit more quickly or slower. But whereas goldfinches. Gorgeous little bird. We're seeing more of these at our centre. They're very stressed, goldfinches. So that one is, oh no, bother, 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 bother. Oh no, bother, 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 bother. <laughs> so very thin. Um, as you say, just sounds stressed. Yes. Yeah, there's, 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 there's the, the mafia finch, the chat finch. <laughs> I shot you. And the goldfish finches the stressed bother, bother, damn it, damn it, damn it, bother, bother, bother. Oh no. <laughs> um, we've got a few more of these because I think I'll, they're great. I'll, I'll do this one. Okay. So, one of my favourite birds are goldfinches. Um, they've never seen them that often, but they're, they're always around. Quite unusually, maybe for small birds, goldfinches tend to mate for life and the pairing stays together. If you see a female or a male bullfinch, unless it's a very unlucky bullfinch, um, you'll, you'll see that the mate is nearby. And they were busily taking all the, um, the buds off the plum trees opposite my house a few weeks ago. Um, then they moved on to the hawthorn that was coming out. And it was a real treat to see them. And they've disappeared again now, um, presumably bothering somebody else's fruit trees. I don't know. But they're very, very low key. Um, and they... They don't really have a song, although they can sing, but rather like the, the long-tailed tits, they have a constant, subtle, quiet call, which sounds a bit like, <laughs> hence the picture, unfortunately, of Hugh Grant, whether you like Hugh Grant or not, but it's that very subtle, quiet call. You quite often see them kind of fans. Yes, sitting next to each other, just adoring each other on a, on a branch somewhere, um, winter or summer. Um, however, bullfinches have a phenomenal capacity to sing. They just don't do it. So if you've done that... I'm really looking forward to this. Tell me about the extraordinary musical abilities of the male bullfinch. Well, if we were to listen to a, a male bullfinch singing his natural song, I think uh, we would all probably be a little bit disappointed. Uh, it's been likened to a squeaky wheelbarrow. That's a bit harsh. A 
Okay, I think you'll agree. It's not it's not <laughs> stunning, and you know, that makes it sound better than it really is because it's normally delivered in a very quiet way. But the most remarkable thing is that if you were to take a young bullfinch from the nest and whistle a tune to it many times each day for several weeks, it's capable of memorizing and performing at a very high level. Just listen to this one. to believe that that's, that's a bird. extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it, it... So, why? Who knows? Um, I mean, we've often, I suppose, captured songbirds and kept them in cages, um, and we can teach birds it's to repeat words. Well, it's much better than a bunch. We're going to have a bullfinch <laughs> next time. You'd expect budgie. somebody to be strolling down a road with their arms behind their back, which yeah. a cheery tune if you heard that through a woodland. But why is is a little bit of a mystery. Um, and who found that out is another interesting Somebody that well. raised a bullfinch. Yeah, well, probably. <laughs> Whistled a lot, I think. Yeah. Okay. But, um, what about this little choppy down here? Well, what, I can't remember. Oh, yes, this is the, um, this, this chap. If you've ever um, driven down a road with lots of gravel in it, and then when you go back onto the smooth road, you find that there's a stone stuck in the wheel. Um, this is the somewhat troubled and scratchy um, sound that you'll you'll hear from a siskin. So yeah, you've got the wheel, da -da 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 -da. wheel, da -da -da -da. I think they have a quite um, a nasal, whingy, whining sound about them. Yeah, Poor definitely. Um, they're, they're always complaining about something. We've got loads of them where we work. Yeah. Um, they're also very, they're very tough. They kind of punch above their weight. Um, they're quite belligerent around a bird table. They will shove. Um, bigger birds off a bird table, um, mob-handed. Um, the other thing about what would anybody like to point out the similarity between because uh, we're still on the visuals as well, the similarity between those two birds, or one of the similarities, rather than just their song. Not the colour. <laughs> not no, not the colour, definitely not the colour. Their beaks. Yeah. Um, quite a lot of finches. I mean, finches are specialists, so um, tend to be seed eaters, and there's a very wide range of beaks. But unlike insect eaters, they tend to have a heavier look to them. So both bullfinch and siskin there, you can see have a, a much broader, heavier looking beak. When you get up to things like green finches, um, then even more so. Um, but all of them have a bit of a specialism. So bullfinches, crossbills, all these. Um, in fact, it was Charles Darwin who looked at Finch yes, beaks, I absolutely. think. I'm sure that saw the distinct differences between different islands in the development of those those beaks. So the longer something is around and the more niches it is able to occupy, the more diversity you get within that, that broad range of animals. So um let's not stray too far into a college. Oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> Stick yeah, with yeah we are songs. running for time, yeah, so let's wrap yeah. on. Um, um, I had no idea there were so many Dunnocks around uh, the area I live before we did this course. Um, so we'll start with the wren because these two are related. The wren is um, the bird, the smallest bird with the loudest voice. We quite often say this about people, um, that the, you know, the small people are shout the loudest. Well, that's true in the bird world too. Right. That's not doing any favours. No, I mean, obviously that's recorded from yeah. quite far away. But the key to the wren is that <laughs> trill in the middle of the of the wren's song. So it's not very, there's no phrases that are repeated. 
but whatever it's singing, it has that in the middle of it. And they all sound angry. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so the Dunnock. I have to stop this one first. It's going up the seat. It just carries on and on and on. Dunnock is a much overlooked bird. Um, so on on your bird feeder, you'll find it creeping around on the ground. It kind of keeps in the background. It's not particularly showy. It's a little brown um, job. Yes, it's a little brown bird. It's got quite an interesting breeding behaviour, but that's another thing. <laughs> So again, like the wren, it's very chattery, but it doesn't have that in the middle of its song. And the aid men while we were here for, for this one is, um, oh, please can I have one, Daddy? Please can I have one? I really, really want one. I really, really want a lolly. Thank you. You know, <laughs> constant nagging child. It's very horrid. Yeah, so song. machine gun for the wren. Um, machine, machine gun trills there. Um, we'll talk about sonograms in a minute. Uh, nagging child, please, Daddy, please, can I have a lolly? Please, I've been really, really good. <laughs> Hurried, bubbling, warble, repeated. That's it. Uh, ooh, I'll just go back to the sonogram. So um, on the course we were we were on, we were shown lots of these sonograms. So it's like the, the visual aid of the audio that we're listening to. So the, the frequencies of bird songs can be shown um, on, a, on a sonogram graph here. Um, some people that are more visual learners find it easier than using the, the sort of, um, the, the spoken word aid memoirs or some people that are pictorial learners might find it easier to associate the pictures with the birds for, for remembering the bird calls. But moving on from that, you can also look at sonograms. So some people can look at a sonogram and hear the bird uh, singing. So these lines represent pitch so that the higher up the line is or the marks are on the sonogram, the higher pitched it is. And then the sort of more vibratory one, you can see this is the, the wren's call here in sonogram form. And it's warbling up and down, chattering away, some high notes, some low notes, um, and it's sort of burbling warble. And then this, this fractious bit in the middle is that machine gun trill. So um, it can be quite interesting looking into the sonograms of bird call too. We we posted a load up on our website a couple of years ago because one yeah. of our volunteers recorded Dawn during chorus. Dawn Chorus. Um, picking the individual songs out is quite interesting. Yes. But he started really, really early. So one of the first things you're hearing were tawny owls <laughs> <laughs> on this the sonogram. And then slowly more and more things come in and you see the complexity of this graph increase. Mm -hmm. um, We'll give you a few, again, a few more commoner garden birds that you might we'll see. Go these quite we'll, have, we'll go through these quite quickly because we are running way over time now. So um, we all get blue tits coming to our um, garden feeders. Um, the One of the ones that mo people find most confusing is the difference between the blue tit and the coal tit because they both share the same sort of habitat. You're talking about blue tit and great tit. Blue tit. Yeah, sorry, great tit. Great tit and blue tit, sorry. No, no great, great tit and cold tit. tit. Cool yeah, sorry. Tits. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> great tits and cold cool tits, tits both share the same habitat. They're both relatively <laughs> common. You'll both get them visiting at the same time, and they both sound broadly similar. So the distinction here is that the great tit has a very good teacher, has good elocution. Enunciate. It enunciates. Perfectly. So this is the great tit. So that teacher, 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 teacher. On the other hand, the cold tit has led a much more um surly life. Yes, the so, <laughs> has has Maybe move from the straight and narrow slightly and um, has a little bit of a, maybe um, maybe doesn't drink quite the right things alcohol. all the time, fondness yeah. for alcohol, 
um, sounds a little bit more like somebody trying to do the same thing after they've been sleeping on a park bench for a few weeks. It's much more slurred. So the first note runs into the second note. It's not enunciated. Cats and cups. It's slurring. Um, the two, Steve from the BTO was the first to admit and frequently got it wrong <laughs> as we were walking down. <laughs> so quite difficult. So it doesn't help okay. sometimes that the great tit, just to show off every now and then, chucks in an extra note. Um, yeah, teacher, teacher. And also, <laughs> not quite in the same way as starlings or thrushes, but is also a bit of a mimic and it will pick up particularly other bird songs occasionally. And then just chuck in the odd random note. But again, if you walk up <coughs> anywhere in a woodland where these animals are, you will almost certainly hear both calling quite often over the top of each other. So yeah. it can be quite difficult. But that teacher sound, at least you've then eliminated it down to two species. So you've at least um, got, got it down to one out of two. Then maybe you're looking for a visual, yeah. visual clue. Yeah. Um, the blue tit, one of my favourites, um, I didn't realise that's what I was listening to for so long. They don't have um, a structured song. They just cheap away. Um, they don't have rep repetitive phrases but they always start the song the same way. And they start with Beethoven's fifth, da 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 da. So that's what we're listening to now. So they always have that same da 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 da, and then they'll go off onto the, the burbly, whatever. I know. I just put it in. Okay. So, yeah, drunken teacher, perfect teacher, and Beethoven's fifth. Okay, again, looking at the sonograms. Uh, this uh, this helps quite a few people. Um, so you've got you can see the the clear cut teacher teacher on this sonogram and the slurred drummed in teacher teacher. And then you can or some people can musicians among us can see the da 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 along there. So yeah, sonograms can be quite interesting. Some bird ID apps will have the facility to show you these. Um, there's one called um, Bello Canto, um, which will almost overwhelm you with information. But you can, if you go on to Bello Canto, you can search um, birds by species. The, the song are uploaded, or the songs are uploaded from all over Europe and beyond. So, again, you, you tend to find there's a wee bit of difference. But the, 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 the sound files are uploaded by all sorts of different people, so you get the you get the, the difference the in if there are lots of them, if they're a long way away, or if they're closer, or if their song is slightly different. And again, you can you can search based on location. So if you want to look at birds specific to areas of Scotland, you can kind of narrow it down, and then you get a whole sequence of different sound files that can run from literally a few seconds to sort of seven or eight minutes, depending on how it's great for meditation. dedicated you Mindful are. Mindful moments. Well, depends what you're listening to. Is that Zeno Canto or Bello Canto? Zeno Canto. Zeno, yeah. Zeno Canto. Zeno Canto. <laughs> I, just, I was just looking for it there and I'll pop it in. There's also there. quite, Thank a, you, a, quite a nice app. Once you start to listen to a few of the songs, the, the, um, the Scandinavian one. Yeah, there's a Scandinavian app. Which I know. Yes, um, not the Norwegian weather forecasting one. Um, it's called, it's from Nord University, so Norwegian, um, and it basically just comes up as Bird ID. So if you Googled Nord University Bird ID, they, again, you can narrow this down to 
um, they do three levels of quiz. So from simple through to intermediate up to expert, you can pick, um, for example, to listen to 10 or 20 different songs. Um, for every one you get right, you get one point. They'll give you four options to choose from yeah. as well. Yeah, so you, yeah, they don't make it's it too fun. difficult for you. We quite often do it in the car on the way to work. Yes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, um, they're quite harsh, though, being a university, yes. because for everyone you get right, you get one point. For everyone you get wrong, you lose two points. So you can end up with a zero score if you're having a bad day. Minus. Well, yes, yeah. Um, but you can narrow it down to, again, to specific areas, but you can also narrow it down to broad habitat as well, which is quite good. So you can look at wetland, you can test yourself up on wetland birds or <coughs> upland birds, or you can just take a, a generic quiz at a particular level. And, and again, I say you can expand out the area you do it. Um, the <coughs> a little bit about the things that the BTO does. Um, I've slowly ended up doing more and more things with the BTO. So I've been doing garden bird watch now for a couple of years. Um, it's a bit like great garden. Great Garden Bird Watch, the RSPB um, Citizen Science event that runs in January, except you do it all year round. And that might sound a bit onerous, but it, it's kind of a notepad on, yeah, the a notepad on my table in the yeah. kitchen, the feeder's outside, and I jot down what's there. And slowly but surely, it's fascinating because you start to see the ebb and flow of species throughout the year, and then you start to see the wee fluctuations. And you get to know the regulars. And one of my regulars is that, <laughs> is that sparrow. My house is full of sparrows. Um, they've managed to burrow themselves in under the uh, barge boards of the house. And they live in these really squabbly slum colonies living on top of each other, making a terrible mess and arguing all the time. Um, but I, it's great to see them because how sparrows have gone through a, a bit of a tough time over the last few years as well. So I don't mind them having around. They're really repetitive songs as well. <laughs> um, the, I'm also involved in the um, wetland bird survey, and that, again, mostly takes place in winter. And that is literally just going out once a month. You can guarantee it's always pouring with rain. Um, when I do a <laughs> wetland bird survey, and again, the BTO... Um, has various wetland areas. This wetland's very broad. This can be coast, it can be marsh, it can be rivers, it can be lochs. And again, you're looking at mostly the assemblages of migrant birds and how they fluctuate throughout the year. You can do it all year if you like, but they're primarily interested in that in that um, period between October and March, when the weather's at its worst. <laughs> um, they try to do it on the same day each year. Um, on the same day each month, so they get a consistency of results. But again, the nice thing about all of these surveys is the BTO give you an awful lot of feedback. So on the Garden Bird Watch now, when I go onto it, I get a pie chart and it shows me all of the species that I've recorded over the two years and the percentage number of times they've occurred each uh, over that period. So, you know, sparrows are 100%. Um, <laughs> Sparrow hawk is less than one percent. <laughs> um, the you they also you also have the option of recording other wildlife in your garden. So they do things like mammals. Um, so quite often mine is domestic cat. Um, <laughs> they do reptiles, amphibians, butterflies, bees, and some other invertebrates as well. And they also try and keep a record of if there are any sick or injured birds in your garden as well. Talking about sick. All of that is optional. Yeah. If we go on to that one, if you click on a couple. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we're kind of pushed for time. These are just showing some of the, the feedback. Diversity of species within gardens has increased. That's oh, that probably, the, that yeah, one. that's probably Sorry. primarily because of the fact that our feeding of birds now is so much more sophisticated. We, 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 they, they fine dine now. It's not a few peanuts and a, and a cut across the bread anymore. Thanks, Mary Lou. Sorry, I have to go. <laughs> um, the other thing, though, is with 
concentrations of animals, we run the risk of disease. And in Ford at the moment, unfortunately, it looks like we have an outbreak of trichomonosis. Um, this is a, a disease that affects all birds. Um, it cannot be transferred to mammals, including humans. Um, but it primarily manifests itself in finches. It's had quite a, as you can see, a devastating effect on greenfinch numbers. And I don't see them much anymore. But it will transfer across to the likes of chaffinch and siskin. And we've had a lot of siskins die quite suddenly in Ford. Um, difficult sometimes to know what to do, but things that you can do are make sure before you see any evidence of it that your feeders are disinfected regularly um, and more regularly if the weather's wet and um, that, that, that it speeds the transfer of the disease. Um, if the disease is evident, and quite often it's evident in birds that look, they just look ill. They're puffed up because they're cold and they're puffed up because they're starving. Um, trichomonosis causes the throat to swell. The birds can't feed. However, they don't know that and they will continue to try to feed. They transfer the virus onto the food that they pick up and then drop through their saliva gets picked up by other birds, that transfers the disease. Um, the hope is that you can break the cycle. So if it's in your garden and you have birds with that disease, stop feeding completely for a couple of weeks, consider moving the feeders and disinfect everything. Um, it, there's quite a lot of information from BTO and RSPB. It's not quite as simple as it looks, because there is the risk that the more assiduous you are, the more you will push the birds on to gardens where folk aren't as assiduous. So these things are never quite as simple as it looks. Mm. So you really have to kind of make the decision based on where you are, what your neighbours do maybe, and how far away the next bird feeder is. I mean, a lot of birds' territories are quite small, so you might just have lots of grumpy birds, but at least they'll be healthy. <laughs> um, so... Uh, yes, it, it's, it's no matter what species we talk about, um, disease is never far away. So there have been massive benefits to us feeding birds with, of course, big increases in things like goldfinch. Um, but there's always, unfortunately, a bit of a downside sometimes. So it's just a case of keeping an eye. Um, I think we can skip the silhouettes. We've done enough okay. on the silhouettes. So these were just ones we were going to ask you uh, to guess. We'll just go back a second. Um, so even without the silhouette, all of these animals have got very distinctive shapes. So you can pick any one you want. The size of the beak on the kingfisher, massive. The ridiculously long tail on the long tail tip, <laughs> which is very appropriately named. Um, the posture of the dipper and the woodpecker. Yes. Um, we feed our woodpeckers on um, the fat balls we use. We cut lengths of wood, bore holes into the side of them, push a fat ball in. That mimics the, the preferred stance of the woodpecker. And watching them demolish a fat ball is quite something. <laughs> it's yeah. like hitting it with a machine gun. Bits go <laughs> everywhere. Um, the birds on the ground take the benefit of that as well. Um, so, and this final bit here, we well, again, we just had a look at the fact that if you're in an area where there are lots and lots and lots of birds and they're in dense cover, it's often quite difficult to figure out who's who. Um, BTO also do quite a lot of moorland work as well, and the same issues are aware there, but you're actually looking for fewer birds. <laughs> um, there are fewer species the harsher the climate, really, as simple as that, and, the, and the, the less food there is within any particular habitat. I love the meadow pipit one. Um, with the reason it's there's a picture here is because it's like riding a bicycle down a hill. It gets faster and faster and faster. I that one again from the start. Oops. Oh, 
I think that's one of the best. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It literally sounds like an accelerating squeaky bike. Yeah. Very distinctive. <laughs> um, and then our beautiful Skylark, my favourite one with the, the burbling when it starts. And that was the call, sorry. That's a summer day for me. And of course, quite often you're just looking for a little speck in the sky. There it is. Uh, that's a mark on your computer screen. That's a mark on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Mimicking the skyline. Um, okay. And so. another one that I just put on because I love this is the um, <laughs> the, the snipe that replicates a foot pump. Um, again, very very easy hate memoir. Slightly repetitive, but quite <laughs> distinctive. Um, Snipe and... Um, what was this one? Oh, this is, is the, the noise of the yeah. wings, isn't it? Yeah, again, it's beautiful. And you can see on that image there, the specially adapted feathers that create that noise. I first heard that when I was trying to find my way back to a B and b after having been in the pub in Applecross for quite a long time. <laughs> and it was really spooky because okay. it was very loud. Um, it was almost post-dusk. Mm. And then this, 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 this <laughs> sound came out of the gloom. Um, so that roading sound is quite simple. Um, yeah, more silhouettes here. But this, uh, this is the last piece of audience participation. Um, I said I was going to test you, so for the final slide, we're back to the most obvious thing that we look at in birds, which is kind of plumage and colour. Um, and I found this fascinating. Would anybody like to have a guess? We'll start top left and work our way along left to right on the rows. Um, would anybody like to shout out what they think these birds might be? Robin. That's a robin. It is a robin. Well done. Blackbird. Black yep. Chaffinch. Not a chaffinch. Yeah. Oh dear. Is it? That's a chaffinch. It's a chaffinch. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and slap. Oops, where have I gone? That way. This one, we don't see a lot of these in our garden. Black headed I... gull. No. Oh, it could be a black headed gull, no, couldn't it? It's not. No, but it's okay. not. Magpie. Yes, magpie. Yeah. yeah, well done. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. you must have blue tit. No, no, blue tit. Blue tit. Blue tit. Gold crest or fire yes. crest. Oh, yeah, not sure which. I think we're gold going to gold. Fire, yeah. But I'll, I'll give you a point for that. It's golden. <laughs> well done. Lots of, it stumps lots of people, I was about to say. Graham, grouse. Yeah, yeah big black, grouse. Fat, black grouse. Bullfinch. 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 Fabulous. Great tit. Great tit. Yep. What what sound does a great tit make? Oh. Teacher. Ah. Teacher. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and well enunciated <laughs> as well. Beautifully enunciated. Yeah. This one is not found in Scotland. Cuckoo. No. Ooh. We talked about them earlier as the 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 Green Chaffinch. That's the chaffinch. Oh. That's um we had these earlier. Yes, oh. that's a uh, goldfinch. Is it? No, that's not the goldfinch, yeah. Chaffinch. That's definitely a chaffinch. Alright. I don't have no, the an no. I don't have the answers to this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do chaffinch. Okay, okay. Right. Well, I'll, I'll, look the, I'll look I'll look them up in my yeah. glorious guide. That's gonna be a Top one's a goldfinch. I yes. a okay, for yeah, that's, right. that's good. Okay, this Jackdaw. one. Jackdaw. Oh, see, yeah, we had this discussion. Uh, uh, you thought Jackdaw, I thought Black Cap. Well, I thought we thought that was a black. Never mind. Go on. Oh, anyway, what about the next this one? This one we can't agree on. Anybody, any guesses? <laughs> Jay. Jane, I never thought about Jane. Hasn't got the. Could it show the blue? No, it wouldn't ask the blue. Yeah, that's the one we're stumped on anyway. Black mm. Green finch. Green finch, yeah. good, good. And swallow. 
Yeah, well done. Oh, see, collectively, you're all we're all experts. As uh, if we could amalgamate all our skills into one, we'd be an expert at bird ID. We had a, a <laughs> swallow flew into our centre today. Oh and yeah, managed to catch it quite quickly. They are just so beautiful, <laughs> and they they weigh nothing. Um, it's it, it. Oh, you had to collect it out the window. Yeah, you? I had to collect it out the window. Let it back out again. It had done a couple of circuits by this point, sussing out as whether we were a decent nest site or whatever. Um, put it outside. I couldn't discern. I could feel the bird in my hand. I could discern no weight to it at all. Um, and again, pens, twenty pet. Yeah, oh, no, it's yes, it's uh, um, <laughs> wrong speaking. That when you think of the distances these animals fly, and we we talk quite a lot about swifts on the BTO course as well. But that, that here's an animal that you know from the point of leaving the nest. Is just on the wing until it next has bred and wants to lay eggs. Mm -hmm. um, there's a story about, um, I think it was First World War, a French pilot who was flying 10,000 feet, maybe, um, way beyond what the normal range would be, came back with a story of seeing swifts flying at that height and was rubbished because people couldn't believe that this tiny animal could fly at such a height. Mm -hmm. We now know that when swifts fly to that height, they have the capacity to shut down one and a half of their brain and sleep. And they very, very slowly descend. And then they'll swap over to the other side of the brain and sleep again. That is how that evolves. I do that permanently. <laughs> I'm not sure I do the swapping over, but well, half my brain's asleep. Yeah, I've done that with my identification this evening. <laughs> you said the wrong words. Um, but that's due to exhaustion, not due to flying. Um, but, yeah... It, and I suppose that's one of the things that most fascinates me about, well, all wildlife, but birds in particular as well, I suppose, is how do they get to that state? Yeah. How, does how that do they evolve? know where they're going? How do they occupy that niche? Um, so, <laughs> Right, we'll have to wrap it up now because we're yes. way over time. Sorry, sorry. Um, does anybody, thank you, Kenny, you've put up some uh, links to our website, the BTO website, which I would highly recommend anybody go to. Um, the links to the apps that we've talked about are also on the BTO website. You'll find them there. And the courses they run on Fab. Um, and they're, they're great. They're great guys. They're great hosts. And of course, Kermot Museum's uh, website there for more talks and activities and guided walks. Just be aware that when you go onto the BTO website, there is so much stuff on it. The pages load Slow. really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the slowest websites I've ever come across. So just bear with them. It all does come up eventually. Um, does anybody if, have any questions for us before we let you Yeah, by, by all means, unmute, unmute yourself if you've got a question or you can pop it into the chat. No, stunned and amazed them all. Uh, I, that that was such a great talk, by the way. That was, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> So well, it's, I mean, it's all credit to the BTO um, for lending us their um, their presentation because we thoroughly enjoyed it. So we thought we'd share it with others. And it makes a change from talking about beavers. It does. <laughs> um, but just thinking that repetitive sound of my computer fan in the background sounds like a grasshopper warbler. It does. <laughs> so again, uh, we've once got you those. Start, <laughs> With these little phrases and things, yeah, you, yeah, listening to everything, it really helps switch on. And it's actually we we did a, a mindfulness day event recently at our centre, and and we did things like shutting our eyes and listening to the sounds of the woodland and things. And it's it's just wonderful for like um, just broadening your mind and making you all relaxed and connected to everything. So I would highly recommend it to everyone. And everybody. then we did. Exactly the same thing, exactly the same place during the BTO course at our viewpoint yes. overlooking the ad estuary, where again, you closed your eyes for 10 minutes, had a piece of paper, and you were, were trying to, you were doing a point survey. So you were trying to record where the sounds were coming from, how far away they were on, on the basis of like near, middling, or far, um, and obviously trying to identify what those those birds might be. And then when you open your eyes, you're looking at, ah, well, I was looking over there because that's a bit of woodland. The viewpoint's great because it sits in woodland, but it looks over an estuary. Mm. So you can get 
Will, you, Willow, so Warbler and Curlew together, or, or um, Canada, Canada geese and a, and a whatever, a wren. Um, and a cuckoo. And a cuckoo. But lots of Canada geese. <laughs> yes, cuckoos as well. So, I can't believe um, I said cuckoo earlier. I knew it was woodpecker. I knew it was... T- Oh. And honestly, who said that? Who said Welcome that? I, that's mine. I'm taking that. Uh, yeah, it, it, so no one has any questions, I don't think. Um, well, if everybody wouldn't mind putting their camera on before they before they go and turning unmuting themselves as well, what I like to do at the end of um, every I'm talk is as uh, sing a song. No, as I just like to because it's um, we will hopefully be moving into real life presentations um, very soon. We do we do have quite an international audience now. You know we've got people from Stoke on Trent and Musselburgh. No. So, um, oh, but across but across Scotland and across the, the world. So th- these online talks are really great. Um, yes. If everyone wouldn't mind just giving Pete and Ollie um, a but wee bit of appreciation and giving them all a round of applause. Oh. <laughs> really... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you for coming along. Yes. Yeah, no, that, was, that was really excellent. Um, normally we, we lose quite a few people for these talks, but actually we gained people for this talk, so that was really nice. So well done. <laughs> Um, if you ever get the chance to come and see us, we keep a, we keep a sightings board just inside our centre. We try and record each season the birds, not just that we see, but the people. It's great when people come in and, like the last couple of weeks, oh, I've just seen a wind chat or I've just seen a century. And love. the kettle's always on. And we, we record the date. And again, it is all part of that building up the data over time as well. And if you okay. come on come on a Thursday. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. No, 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 absolutely. I would absolutely um, <laughs> encourage and recommend people to go Sorry, down to Will, Ballin Dive, which is when's cake day? day. When's cake day? Indeed. Well, we, 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 that's a very good, I think in the summer, we used to, we used, we used to, to have to cake, cake Sunday. We, we know. Re- now that we're back to some sort of vague normality, I think we should reinstate cake Sunday. So Good idea. That's okay. Good. Yeah, no, th- thank you so much. And again, I do, yeah, I do recommend. Excellent, excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks thank you. for organising as well. Yeah, thanks, yes. Kenny. Yeah. Yeah, no yeah. worries at all. You we've put got, us under got... massive pressure by calling us experts, yeah. but we'll, we'll forgive you. <laughs> much more expert than me, anyway. Felt. It's all right. Have you? Oh, well, yeah. okay. Just, just to say um, again, thank you very much, Pete and Ollie. But do check out the links there if anyone has it. Yeah, it's a bit of time. Yeah, there's some, there's some we, good stuff there. And we've got. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, yeah, no, I, was, I was just, I was just going to wrap up and just, just say, like, please do go and visit the um, the the Heart of Ar- Argyle Wildlife website and donate if you can, and or join as a member. You can also donate to the Kilmartin Museum. Next month's talk for Kilmartin Museum. Uh, is well, or rather, the next talk with Kilmartin Museum is on the second of June. It's with Dr. Angela Boyle, who's an osteoarchaeologist, uh, and her uh, research was into was into violence between the fifth and eighth centuries in Scotland and southeast Scotland. Uh, so she's been looking at skeletons. So quite gruesome and gory, perhaps this one, but but no less interesting. Um, but the actual the actual next scheduled talk that we have. Uh, so, because that was one was rescheduled from me, and the next scheduled talk we have is with Dr. Susanna Harness, who's my former lecturer from the University of Glasgow. Uh, she's uh, a specialist in textiles and prehistoric textiles, so she'll be looking at prehistoric textiles with a Kilmartin context. So that will be really interesting. And at the end of June, we also have a talk from Davy Donaldson, um, who is a traveller. He'll be looking at Scottish traveller history and heritage. Uh, so those yes. are all coming up in, in June. So if you would like to register, um, just go to our website, kilmartin.org, and it's the evening talks under the events page. Please do sign up. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you all for, for joining tonight. Special thanks to Pete and Ollie. Pete and Ollie, I'll see you on Saturday for the guided walk. Yeah. Uh, and to everyone else, I hope you have a pleasant evening. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.